residency. So Chrissy Chapman came to us uh, by way of Cornell. Uh, we've had a collaboration for the past three years with Cornell in Tanzania. And this uh, last week, uh, we took a, a large brand surgery team there and had an incredibly successful trip. So those of you that remember Frank from Tanzania, he's got kind of the junior afro, um, an amazing doc. He, he was there, and this is at his hospital where he's the only ophthalmologist. And really over the next uh, five to ten years, we'll be collaborating academically with their program to build a training program. Uh, Kristen's former program director, chairman, were there and spoke highly of her. So maybe I'll just record this with my iPhone and send it to them this morning for some too. Pass that on. Then uh, following that, uh, we'll have uh, Victor Wang, who's in neurology. Hi, good morning. My name is Kristen Chapman. I'm one of the Glaucoma Fellows this year, and I'm going to talk about one of um, my favorite medications, but also one of the most dangerous. Um, so steroids and glaucoma. So I thought I'd go through a couple of cases of patients that I saw this year that uh, really affected the way that I think about steroids. Um, the first being a 19-year-old male that two years ago presented to his outside ophthalmologist with eye redness and irritation, was given prednisolone BID to use in the left eye, um, and kind of disappeared to follow up until he presented to us with uh, left-sided pain, headache, redness, and blurry vision. He was on his mission in England when this happened, um, and at that time he had a medical history significant for asthma on, on all B-roll and uh, out there. Um, and he came to us with the vision down in the left eye to 2060, fixed it in the dilated pupil with a 2 plus APD and a pressure of 54. We also found out at that time that he had been using prednisolone BID for the past two years since being prescribed it for his pinguicula. So the anterior segment was significant for, he, he did have a pinguicula, but the eye was very injected. Um, there were no other manifestations of secondary glaucoma, um, uh, no TIDs, no Kuchenberg spindles. He was completely open on gonioscopy. And the posterior segment exam um, was really remarkable for asymmetric cupping with a 0.9 cup to this ratio in the left eye. Uh, fundus photos don't exactly give it justice to how uh, deeply excavated this uh, cup was. Um, again, photos and the OCT, again, for how advanced this glaucoma was, is only demonstrating uh, thinning in two quadrants. But the visual field really tells the whole story in this left eye, where he's left with a remaining central field in the left eye that had been treated with steroids. Second case is quite a different uh, patient. This is a 77-year-old African-American male who came to us about a month and a half after his complicated cataract surgery. Um, he had posterior capsule rupture with a sulcus lens in place with a lot of post-op inflammation. He had no glaucoma and was put on Durazol to treat the um, high inflammation and came to us with blurry vision, feeling like there was vaseline in the eye. Um, in this case, he did have an ocular history of uh, glaucoma treated with Travitan in both eyes. And when we saw him, he had been taken off Durazol and taken off his Travitan in that eye and was otherwise on Combigan and Cosoft. Uh, his visual acuity in that left affected eye was 2060, pinholing to 2040, mostly secondary to the large um, areas of phimosis from the capsule um, and high uh, AC inflammation. And his intraocular pressure, while all nose drops, was 26. Um, again, he did have a sulcus lens in that eye and still had residual uh, 2 plus pigment itself, flare, um, and open uh, angle glutenoscopy. Posterior segment exam demonstrated uh, bilateral and symmetric. In his photos and OCT already fell with the left eye already demonstrating a little bit more progression than the normal. The last case, again, very different profile, 42-year-old uh, white female with uh, pars planitis, who had been treated with uh, systemic steroids and most recently topical steroids and a septenons injection of Kinolog for uh, CME. Uh, five uh, months after the Kinolog injection, her IOP was still uh, elevated to the 50s even though she's on max, maximum medical therapy. This patient was difficult because in her uh, course with carsplenitis, she didn't tolerate any kind of systemic immunosuppression or steroids, and really was hesitant to take anything like diamox or methazolamide. Again, she had carsplenitis and was on maximum topical therapy and was not tolerating and not willing to take diamox or methazolamide. Her, pressure, her uh, visual acuity was 2020, but her pressure was 50 despite all the topical therapy. Um, on her, again, her ankle was open and her cup to disc. Uh, initially, when she was seen with fundus photos, cup to disc was symmetric with 0.2 cup to disc ratio, and it de definitely demonstrated progression over the last four months with elevated FDP. 
again, her photos from the beginning, healthy REM. And so these three cases uh, demonstrate an atrogenic glaucoma in a young male, a 77-year-old uh, patient, second case being a 77-year-old patient with no glaucoma, active inflammation, and the third being a patient with a long-term depot of steroids. So indications for steroid use, uh, the BCSC uh, recommends using for active inflammation, to prevent inflammation, or reduce inflammation um, in the core of the retina. They uh, advise to uh, start high and aim low, not to titrate up on, on steroids, but rather start with the appropriate dose to quench any kind of um, inflammation and then to prevent The pathophysiology of steroid-induced glaucoma um, it's thought to be remodulation at the level of the trabecular mesh work, at the level of the angle. Um, on a genetic level, some of the myosome, which is also associated with juvenile opening of glaucoma, is thought to be upregulated. Some studies have even demonstrated that there's a mechanical aspect where parts of kinolog or parts of the uh, interventional injection can actually come in and clog the trabecular mesh work. Within um, steroids and glaucoma, it's about a third, a third, a third, a third are mild responders, less than six uh, millimeters mercury, which is still could be 20% increase for that patient. A third are thought to be moderate responders, and the third patients can actually uh, increase more than 15 millimeters mercury. So presentation is very rarely uh, less than two weeks, uh, which is why we often bring patients back at a two-week interval to check for IOP. Um, and usually pressure can reduce, uh, go back to baseline about a, a week or so after steroids have been discontinued. So there's some certain patient-dependent risk factors. Um, having no glaucoma, um, angle recession glaucoma or family history even of glaucoma are all known risk factors for people that might be high steroid responders. Myopia, diabetes, and connective tissue disorders have also been associated, as well as children under six might be at higher risk for being strong steroid responders. Steroid dependent risk factors include the type of steroid, the dose of steroid, and the duration of use. So, example uh, being the first case where the patient had been using steroids for two years consecutively. Drug delivery um, has really, we have a lot of options besides topical. Um, there are a lot of longer term depots that are being developed and being used actively right now. On the topical side, different types of uh, formulations can alter permeability um, for board's reasons. Prednisone acetate is the best corneal presentation. Um, again, this is why it might be one of our more popular topicals. Um, again, here are some examples of the topicals that we use, some being suspended formulations, which um, might, some patients might have difficulty using or might have a different response if they're not shaken or used uh, appropriately. So kind of a summary of potencies, uh, hydrocortisone is kind of a, the baseline which things are compared against, but some of the lower potency medications include Vexol, um, but medium included uh, prednisolone acetate, which we use frequently, and lopredinol, which has a nice profile in regards to its um, steroid response as well, with dexamethasone being one of our stronger medications. So just as high risk, your risk kind of equals the reward. Uh, steroids with higher um, potency also have higher elevating potential. Uh, some good drops to kind of remember, ethanol, that's all, Lomax, and Alrex are all great drops that have a lower risk of elevating IOP. So TNONS injections, such as our patient in the third case had, have also been used um, as depots in different formulations, um, and most somewhat recently have been used for uh, dropless cataract surgery in a postoperative steroid uh, course as well. So Kinolog, and again, the different kind of dosing, whether 20 milligrams or um, the smaller 4 milligram dose in, used um, in America still has an elevation of IOP. In about 40% of patients, um, remarkably though, patients having a higher baseline IOP are at a higher risk of having elevation of IOP afterwards. And even though we think of sub tenons maybe not as invasive or long-standing, 2% of patients in this study that I reviewed um, required surgery to control their pressure. The SCORE trial is a well-known trial that uh, used uh, steroids in this manner, and patients we know that it helped with visual uh, recovery but also had higher rates of cataracts and higher rates of IRP elevation. From the study, we learned that uh, IRP was elevated 24 to 65% depending on the dose. And risk factors included younger age and higher baseline IRP. Um, so again, it was dose dependent as well. The Algenex implant has become more popular and it's also brought uh, more patients to our glaucoma service. Um, it lasts for about three months and the effects can even go into six months um, with elevation of uh, 
pressure. This, and we'll talk about how to manage this. Now, the Redisert is also something that's been used to control long-term chronic uh, intraocular inflammation and can last up to three years. Within this three-year period, which it works, 33% of patients end up having pressure over 30, which usually uh, involves the treatment with a glaucoma specialist. Um, all this being said, the topicals, the systemic steroids can also have a major uh, impact on IOP, not just uh, oral, but also uh, something like Flonase, where it's a topical intranasal um, that has been found to elevate IOP. So there have been some thoughts about how to prevent or how to predict she might be a steroid responder before doing intravitreal or uh, any kind of more lasting steroids. Some physicians advocate doing a four-week trial of topical steroids to see if the patient is a steroid responder. And also, like most of you uh, mentioned before, checking the IOP after two weeks of initiation of steroid is a good way to keep on top of it to see if the patient might be a steroid responder. So going back to our cases, the first being an antigenic, the second with still uh, active inflammation, and the third with a long-term implant. We can kind of go through uh, what their risk factors were and what we did for their treatment. So some of the treatments would be to stop the steroid. Um, in the case of our second patient with active inflammation, we need an alternative. Um, thought to switching this to an NSAID or any other kind of uh, immune modulating if the effect is more systemic. Um, topical aqueous suppressants. SLT and ALT have been found to have a limited role. Um, they, they may be tried, but they're not a home run in these cases. Filtration surgery tubes. Um, um, have all been used for these, terephylectomy and two have been equal, and also excision of any, or removal of any kind of the implant as well. So in the first case of the patient with iatrogenic glaucoma, um, and this young guy, 19 years old, who had a uh, market cupping, um, and the response was due to an active steroid use. We thought it's stopping the steroid, we could stop the effect. So we didn't really want to put hardware, and he was so young, so we went and did an aventurine trabeculotomy. So in this case, um, this is a modified version. Um, the GAP procedure, which is with a transillumination, um, we've been doing this procedure where you create a goniotomy cleft here with an NVR blade, um, create a little bit of space, and instead of using the uh, transillumination, we can use a fibrochromine, which we'll show in a, in a few seconds. Um, which is blunted with cautery to create somewhat of a mushroom cap that can be led around. So this really decreases uh, the amount of equipment needed to be used for this procedure and can make it a little bit more accessible. So the goal of this is also to treat where steroid induced glaucoma is really hitting. So this is the cautery used to blunt the proline to supply more of the heat. You can see it creates kind of a mushroom blood to cap. Um, sorry, and then the, the proline is fed through the trabecular meshwork and um, brought out to really work at the level of the trabecular meshwork, which is where the steroid um, glaucoma is really active at that level. So I'm the second case with a gentleman with active inflammation um, due to high steroid, uh, high potency steroid after uh, cataract surgery. We stopped the steroid, switched him to an NSAID, and put him on Diamox. He ended up getting uh, a trabeculectomy. And in our third patient uh, with uh, active CME, they've been treated with subtenons, can she also ended up getting a trabeculectomy, and she's done really, really well. Um, something interesting about these patients with uh, depots of steroids in the eye, when they're treated with trabeculectomy or with tubes, they often do really well because all the intraocular inflammation, the things that we're combating to help with scarring, are being treated already with the steroid. So that's one question to really kind of look into is whether or not to remove the steroid depot at the time of the, of the filtration surgery or whether or not to leave it to continue treating the intraocular inflammation. So case updates, the first um, young boy is now, um, after the GAP procedure, pressure of 12, now off drops, including steroids. Um, and the second patient, uh, vision still limited to the phlemosis, but pressure is now well controlled with, after the trabeculectomy, off all drops. And the third, um, she can continue to have steroid treatment locally and avoid any systemic treatment for the CME, 
while keeping your pressure under control. So, some summary points just to start high, aim low, identify risk factors for possible steroid responders, choose steroids carefully, and be aware of the systemic uh, steroid effects. Excited and thank you for everyone that helped you with the care of these patients. about uh, dropless cataract surgery. Uh, it's been a big thing at most of our meetings. And David Chang likes to point out that in, that, in, in his experience, <coughs> the patients that have the biggest spikes of dropless cataract surgery are myopes and new patients. So it's good to keep in mind as we start to move in that direction uh, with using intravenous <coughs> transonomy <coughs> One of your slides said that chlorobethalone had both a high potential and low potential for the increase in intraocular pressure. So is that? Um, trend or? After, yeah, my is missing. So it should be low. Should low. Be mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know if you know why that is. Uh, 